Hello and welcome to The Drum. I'm Steve Kinane. Coming up, Apple accused of shifting $9 billion of untaxed profits out of Australia. Warren Mundine cautions Tony Abbott against changing the Racial Discrimination Act. And fears about the spread of the radical Islamic group trying to impose Taliban-style rule over Syria and Iraq. Our panel tonight, LJ Locke from Republic Consulting, Ben Herskovich from the Centre for Independent Studies, and in Canberra, Fairfax National Political Reporter, Jonathan Swan. And you can join us on Twitter using the hashtag The Drum. Well, first tonight, the government's bill to remove foreign ownership restrictions on Qantas has passed through the lower house. The Deputy Prime Minister says it's about putting the company on a level playing field. Good government's not about playing favourites or being a banker for major companies when times are tough. It's about providing the environment for them to succeed free of unreasonable government impediments. That is what the bill is about. Labor moved quickly to begin a parliamentary debate over the bill. The coalition initially tried a gag motion but then relented. Leader of the House Christopher Pine said the coalition was absolutely delighted to debate its legislation. The opposition would welcome the opportunity to seek leave to allow this debate to proceed immediately. Obviously we are delighted. We are absolutely delighted. This is one of the most extraordinary own goals that I've ever seen in 21 years in politics. The opposition is facilitating, in fact demanding, that the government pass its agenda. And we will. These people opposite are the cheese-eating surrender monkeys of Australian jobs. Their only manufacturing policy is to buy a white flag made in another country and run it up the mast. Every job that is lost at Qantas will be the opposition's fault. The bill seems destined to fail in the Senate, where Labor and the Greens have vowed to block its path. Repealing part of the Qantas Sale Act would allow the company to move maintenance operations offshore. Labor fears the change could put airlines' safety record at risk. The government insists that is not the case. Is the Leader of the Opposition suggesting to this House that Qantas is safe and other airlines aren't? And what I want... What are you saying, Bill? What I want... What are you saying? I mean, what is the Leader of the Opposition suggesting here? The member is he the suggesting, the is he suggesting that the Qantas well. Sale Act well, is somehow responsible safe, for Qantas right? safety? Jonathan, the lower house passed the bill today with Labor voting against it. There would have been a number of Labor MPs who would have been uneasy with the way they voted there, wouldn't they? Yeah, look, it's hard to actually uh, gauge um, how much dissent there is within the Labor Party because they've been pretty disciplined on this. Anthony Albanese... Uh, pinned them into this position very early. Bill Shorten backed him up on it. Uh, I've spoken to a few uh, Labor people who are uneasy about it. Um, they're worried that if they lose this uh, debate, uh, they will be seen as sort of a pre-Hawk protectionist uh, party who's sort of forgotten all the lessons of the reform era and um, it, it could really uh, contradict their jobs message. But certainly if you look at the leadership team of, of Labor, most of them are, uh, are pretty much on board. LJ, is that a danger? I mean, the Australian economy was opened up 20 years ago. Could Labor be seen to be being driven here by nostalgia and populism rather than good economic policy? Nostalgia and populism in, <laughs> in politics. Imagine that. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're talking about one in six Qantas jobs potentially going, one in ten Jetstar jobs. There was a lot of chat from the, um, from the government today about the need to liberate Qantas from its shackles and release the handcuffs. Uh, there was a lot of rhetoric going on and, and there was a lot of talk about a level playing field. But the reality is that the three airline investors in Virgin are all wholly or um, partially government backed and it's not quite the level playing field that everyone's making out. Ben, how do you see this one? I think there is a lot of truth in saying that this is a classic case of Labor failing to live up to the great Hawke Keating legacy. This is one aspect that Labor can be truly proud of and it seems as if right now they're shoveling dirt onto that coffin. But more specifically, I think there's also the issue of this actually being quite bad politically. There's not really the constituency for the type of old school economic protectionism that may have played really well 30, 40, 50 years ago you in don't Australia. Think is different though? Well, I don't think it is because there's a certain amount of, I suppose, emotional intensity associated with the kangaroo flying overseas. But people recognise that that will continue even if it's in part owned by foreign capital. Bringing foreign capital in Australia is something that has made the economy so dynamic. It's been a huge boon for our country. And I think there's broad consensus on that now. In a sense, we're all economic rationalists now. And 
the type of political manoeuvre that they're trying to pull just doesn't have widespread support out there. It might surprise you, but I disagree entirely. Uh, the, the, Qantas, the way Qantas is actually handling the, the threat to jobs and, and the spectre out there in the community of 5,000 jobs being lost, the fact that the unions aren't able to get a straight answer from Qantas about how the redundancies are going to be handled, the time frame, where they're coming from, makes unions even more powerful an option for the workers whose jobs are at risk both at Qantas and elsewhere. Jonathan, can I get your take on Bill Shorten's tactics today in Parliament where he was basically implying if maintenance jobs go overseas, then Qantas will be less safe. H how did those tactics go down? Well, it's always hard to know how anything that goes on inside Parliament plays, you know, in the, in the outside world where, where no-one watches Parliament. You know, 1% of people will suddenly <laughs> sit down and actually watch the thing. Uh, how it played in Parliament... Uh, look, Bill Shorten's argument um, is that if we allow Qantas to, to be majority foreign owned, it will be a more dangerous airline to fly because, you know, that we can't control uh, the maintenance in Australia. And also he says that um, Australian jobs will be shifted overseas. Uh, to, to what Ben and LJ were saying, th neither party has actually done any polling or any significant quant polling on what Australians think about the flying kangaroo. But their focus group stuff, if, if you talk to each side, they tell you quite different things, and, and it's possibly in, in their own self-interest. But the Libs tell you that Australians, you know, that they're talking to in their, in their focus groups are smart enough to know that government doesn't need to intervene, you know, every time a company fails. But Labor are firmly of the view that people expect their government to prop up big companies, particularly big quote-unquote, uh, iconic companies like Qantas. And, and if you actually talk to the travel agents who are out there, I mean, Qantas is being hurt in terms of sales and in terms of ticket sales. If customers are walking into travel agents and they have the option to choose across a whole range of, of international competitors and there are some great deals out there that aren't necessarily with the flying kangaroo. Some very interesting language used from Bill Shorten before. We heard him referring to um, the, the government as the, che uh, the cheese-eating surrender monkeys of Australian jobs. Now... He actually had to withdraw that comment and he said that he thought it was from some American uh, politician. Uh, LJ, has he misled the House here? Because we know that this, uh, this came from the Simpsons. This came from groundskeeper Willie, this Who comment. Who is a politician in his own right <laughs> and full of wisdom. And a janitor, I think. And um, I think he was referring to the French in that, in that quote. Detail, details, yeah. details. <laughs> ben? Well, I think the link with the French is actually a really interesting one here because he's accusing the party that's trying to liberalise the economy further of surrendering jobs. But the reality is that when you have centralised economic management, as you have in France, you end up with a bankrupt welfare state and an economic model that's not particularly dynamic or successful. All righty. LJ, you want to respond to I was just going to say, there's actually a really interesting point of view that's also coming from the tourism and travel industry, from organisations like AFTA, which is that the conversation needs to be a much wider conversation than just about Qantas, that we need to be looking at the aviation sector more specifically. How would they like to see that expanded? Well, just given the fact that, um, you know, Australia is an end-of-line hub and um, there are things that need to be addressed, including access for, for regional and remote Australia, and um, there's some attraction there in, in that being put out to tender above and beyond it just being Qantas and, and domestic airlines. All right, well, let's move on now. And Apple has been accused of shrinking its tax bill in Australia by moving nearly $9 billion of untaxed profits overseas. The Financial Review has obtained 10 years of the tech giant's financial records and the paper claims the move has allowed Apple to pay just 0.7% of its turnover in tax. The California-based corporation has declined to comment on the story, but independent Senator Nick Xenophon has described the report as outrageous. When it comes to paying its fair share of tax, it seems that this apple is rotten to the core. We urgently need tax reform in this country to ensure that companies such as Apple and Google and others pay their fair share. If they don't, uh, it means that hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars, uh, can't be spent on schools and hospitals, on our health system, for essential services. And I think this ought to be an urgent uh, issue uh, on the bipartisan agenda. At last month's G20 meeting, the world's biggest economies agreed to take a stronger action on tax avoidance. The finance minister wants all companies to pay their fair share. Uh, businesses operating around the world um, are not necessarily paying their fair share of tax where they're earning their profits. And our, pro our view is, and that is a view that is shared around the world, uh, businesses should pay their fair share of tax where they earn uh, profits. And... It's important, though, uh, to address that in a coordinated way uh, through uh, international fora uh, like the G20. 
But Labor has accused the coalition of winding back measures to curb tax avoidance. We had initiatives in government which Mr Hockey has unwound to deal with this. He's reversed them at a cost of $700 million uh, and that is a very backward step. The Australian tax system needs to be fair and that means everybody paying their fair share. And it's not fair to other Australian businesses that do pay their fair share of tax if some companies are able to shift profits around to avoid tax. So I'd call on the Treasurer to reverse his reversal of Labor's reforms. LJ, this is an extraordinary story in the fin today by Neil Chenoweth. Uh, $9 billion in untaxed profits over 10 years, or around 40% of what we spend on Apple products in Australia, being shifted off to a tax haven. It's the equivalent of five functioning space stations I worked out, space wow. shuttles. So it, it's not an insignificant money, uh, an insignificant amount of money. The question is, will Apple crumble under the pressure? I like that. Nice no, one. <laughs> ben, is there anything that can be done to, help, to, to, to stop companies like Apple doing this? I don't think there's anything particularly surprising about this case because historically the regulators are always behind the business people. The business people are savvy, trying to maximise profits and minimise costs and you can expect results like this with that kind of commercial incentive at play and the regulators scramble around trying to get things done after the fact. But I think another really interesting aspect of this story is the details that are in the AFR report. And what's clear is that this is actually not about untoward behaviour as such. It's about Apple being as savvy as possible and brokering as many beneficial agreements for them as possible. And so it's almost a case of the government being caught embarrassed by the lack of regulatory framework rather than the company being somehow untoward in moral terms. Jo Jonathan, is there the will within the government to close these loopholes down? There's a contradiction at the heart of all of this for the coalition, uh, which is they've got this agenda, they call it the bonfire of red tape, but, you know, to slash as much regulation as possible. And yet Joe Hockey says that he wants uh, cracking down on international tax minimisation to be at the centre of the G20 agenda. Now, in here lies a conflict because, you know, there are plenty of things you can do to crack down on companies like Apple doing the, the double dutch and the Irish sandwich and whatever they're called, flipping profits from one country to the next. But they all involve regulation. And, and Chris Bowen makes a really important point there. Uh, Labor actually, I mean, they never got it legislated because there was this enormous backlog of legislation. But Labor actually had a recommendation. Uh, they put it forward. They announced it in, in the 2013 budget, which was to scrap it's called Section 25 to 90 of the Income Tax Assessment Act or something like that. And basically what it is is what companies do in Australia is big companies, they put their profits overseas in, in, in countries like Ireland where they can minimise them and they load their debt in Australia so they can pay less tax in Australia. And what this loophole allows them to do is actually get tax, claim tax deductions on already dubious debt that they're loading into Australia. So it's, it's an extraordinary piece of legislation that was introduced in the Howard era, and Sinodinus has actually got rid of Labor's uh, plan off the backlog. So you've got to question what hockey's actually going to do in practical terms as well as, you know, talking about it. Ben, uh, what, what, what do you think? Is that you know, question whether the Coalition's serious on cracking down on this? I think this is a line that plays really well politically because the assumption in the community is that the coalition is in some, some way in bed with big business and therefore it would be very convenient for them to let companies get a tax-free ride, so to speak. But if you actually look at the record of government spending, it's clear that government after government, both Labor and coalition, likes to spend more and more money. The coalition loves spending huge amounts of taxpayers' money just as much as Labor. And so it's a bit ridiculous to say that they're being soft on corporate tax because they have just as much of a vested interest in Labor as having as much tax revenue as possible so they keep on pork barrelling and throwing the money out the door to taxpayers. I thought Ed Husick put it very well today where he talked about us having a, um, a tax regime of plasticine and, and the fact that, the ta that we have taxation arrangements that need to be hauled into the modern era. Uh, he's been chasing this issue for some time, not just with Apple, but a number of MPs have also been looking at Google and Microsoft and hopefully something will be done about it soon. Jonathan, you were trying to well, get in there? I was just going to say, uh, Ben, I don't, I don't understand your point. Are you saying that the coalition has been tough on um, you know, uh, multinationals cracking down on international tax minimisation? It's more that there wouldn't be the political rationale there for them to be soft on companies vis-a-vis -vis corporate tax because they need to get the tax revenues up to spend the money to do the checkbook politics just as much as the other side of politics. So from the optics of it, from the political perspective, it's implausible as a labour attack to say that the coalition 
isn't interested in corporate tax. But Ben, but Ben, there's a really concrete example here, which is this section, um, which it's 25 to 90, which Arthur Sinodin has got rid of on the grounds of um, getting rid of regulation. I mean, surely you'd acknowledge that there is a contradiction between wanting to cut red tape and cracking down on companies who are trying to minimise their tax. Well, you need it... regulation, right? I mean, that's surely a, a contradiction. Of course, there's no argument to say that regulation per se is a negative thing, and the coalition would argue against certain instances of regulation, and perhaps this is one of those instances. But broadly speaking, the argument wouldn't be that they're happy to provide corporations with a tax-free ride in Australia. It's okay. an absurd political argument to All make. All right, let's, let's move on, because we want to talk about a, a, an interesting issue that's coming out of the Middle East. Smuggled video has given one of the few glimpses of life under the radical group ISIS, the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, which has had a series of dramatic military successes in those countries in recent months. The group wants to form an Islamic caliphate in the two states, imposing strict, strict Islamic law in the territories it's taken over. That includes Taliban-like social policing and courts that hand out floggings and executions to minor transgressors and political opponents. ISIS has become a nightmare spectre for Western diplomats looking for a way to intervene in the Syrian civil war without supporting Islamic extremists. This video you're about to see comes from inside the ISIS-controlled city of Raqqa in Syria's northeast. Joining us now is the ABC's foreign affairs analyst Tim Palmer. Tim, thanks for coming on. Um, who are ISIS and, and where are they functioning? Well, initially they were seen as an offshoot of al-Qaeda, even though they have roots that go back to the Zakari terrorist network operating in the early part of the century in Iraq. But uh, they've corralled support from various Islamist groups, initially in Iraq, now in Syria, from al-Nusra, for example. And in fact, over time, al-Nusra and al-Qaeda have both disowned the group, but that hasn't stopped them. They've gone from strength to strength. They want to set up a caliphate in, uh, across both countries, but they're the ones that have actually imposed it as they've gone along. That might be the intention of groups like al-Nusra and uh, al-Qaeda elsewhere, but this video, in fact, shows that this is happening. Uh, they've had successes. They liberated the prison of Abu Ghraib, freed 500 sympathisers there uh, mid last year. In Iraq, most significantly, they took control of Fallujah and Ramadi, you know, the scene of the bloodiest Western mm -hmm. um, victories, the hardest won Western victories when in Iraq. And they've now cut such a swathe across parts of Syria, uh, and especially northern Syria. In fact, the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights says they are now, without doubt, the strongest single group in northern Syria. Now, that, for a start, is why we know so little about what's happening, because they've taken such a, a vicious uh, approach to journalists entering across the Turkish border, one of the few ways that journalists were having access to cover the Syrian war. The stream of journalists has... Uh, dwindled down to virtually nothing now and so we rely on smuggled video like this to show us what the social conditions are and of course uh, reports are that beyond that there are even far worse atrocities being carried out by Well ISIS. what is Amnesty International saying about this because they've looked at some of the conditions yeah, but, in the ISIS controlled areas? And in particular in detentions I mean they talk about uh, bands of masked men roaming the streets snatching people off the streets uh, children being detained and flogged one prisoner describes a boy of 12 being given more than a hundred lashes with uh, metal cables, but prisoners being tortured with electric shock. Uh, in particular, what you hear again and again from fighters from other anti-Assad groups is that they're being detained and in some cases arbitrarily executed. Uh, they often describe their jailers as foreign fighters, Chechens, Moroccans, Saudis. Uh, and some of the executions are 
almost at the whim of these Islamic judges. I mean, one man was executed because uh, he was about to be released. He was arrested for black market currency dealings, was about to be released, but the judge got wind that he'd been making fun of him and ordered that his, he be beheaded. So how does this complicate any potential diplomatic solution to the crisis in Syria? Well, enormously. I mean, it creates problems there on the ground for a start, this sense that an arc of Shia Sunni violence has been created all the way from Iraq across Syria. The group has now uh, announced its intentions to branch out into Lebanon and take the Assad allied Hezbollah on, Hezbollah on in Lebanon. But even more so, when the West is you know, still looking at ways of going to the next set of talks in Geneva, no date set yet, mm. and how hard is that going to be given uh, the West and Russia divide now emerging over Ukraine. It's so hard to see fair dealing uh, in Geneva between them over Syria. The West's single greatest problem all along and its delay has been how do we intervene, in particular how do we arm, without those intentions or those weapons falling into the wrong hands. Well, if the West want, wants to see a spectre of what the wrong hands look like, certainly ISIS and, and this sort of thing is, is the, the worst nightmare, the worst scenario. And while the West is now backing Syrian rebels, the uh, more secular groups, the FSA, and Islamist groups are getting together and pushing back ISIS in some areas, and the government is fighting ISIS in Iraq. They are still holding on to these key population centres at the moment. Tim, we'll have to leave it there. Thanks so much for coming on. Pleasure, Steve. OK, well, the head of Tony Abbott's Indigenous Advisory Council has urged the Prime Minister not to repeal a key part of the Racial Discrimination Act. The government has vowed to remove Section 18C of the Act, which prohibits speech that is likely to offend or insult somebody on racial grounds. Warren Mundine has told the Prime Minister removing the section is the wrong way to go. I believe that this is a, a, an overreaction and, and, um, and I think they're heading down the wrong track in looking at uh, uh, repeal or, uh, or amend, uh, repeal or of abolition of the Section 18C. Um, look, to me, you know, it hasn't, it, you know, you're just basing it on the philosophy of, of free speech. We are all... Uh, people who are involved in these discussions are strong supporters of free speech. Uh, there are there are major issues and major concerns if we if we if we look go on the track of uh, repeal. Labor supports Warren Mundine's view. We agree uh, the Racial Discrimination Act, as it's currently formulated, is appropriate. We don't support changing it. And yes, if Mr Mundine has put that view, then that would be something I would hope What's that the Prime it? Minister would seriously consider. Ben, a tricky one for the Prime Minister. He has deep respect for the views of Warren Mundine, but he's also made a promise to uh, wind back Section 18C or repeal parts of it. This is a really fraught issue for everyone in politics, I think. I suspect that a lot of the added complication to the debate comes from a confusion between two different issues on this topic. And so on the one hand, there's the question of what kind of Australia do we want? What's our vision for the country? And on the other hand, the question of how do we get there? And on the first question, we obviously all want a society without discrimination, without bigotry, without hatred. But with respect to the second question, it's much more complex. I think the assumption that the legal route, legislation, is the way to get to that Australia that we all want is perhaps questionable. Arguably, the most effective means of achieving society that is free of bigotry and discrimination, etc., is civil society. It's the common thrust of debate in the public square. It's people on a crowded Sydney bus, for example, standing up and saying, I'm not going to accept that. But that doesn't I'm, always happen, does it? Of course not. And I think really it rarely happens. happens. Of course, of course. And I think that's partly the issue here. When you say we have legislation in place and that will solve the problem of racism, in a sense that's deferring our responsibility to a higher legal authority, when in reality it should be the responsibility of every individual out there in civic society to make the case. LJ, do you want to respond there? Oh, I, but I do. This is about protecting the vulnerable in our community and we as a community should be standing up for, for higher standards, not plumbing new debts. Complaints under 18C to the Australian Human Rights Commission are up 59% in the last year. There's clearly a community um, demand for this protection, and you know it's not about inhibiting but just, free uh, speech. Just because there's complaints doesn't mean that's not being overused or mi or misused. No, in fact, only um, uh, less than three percent of the complaints um, that actually went through in 2012-2013. Um, didn't actually proceed to either mediation or a court hearing. Mm -hmm. So there was found to be substance right across that. 
these, this is legislation that has been tested comprehensively throughout the court system. And there is a let out with 18D, which provides, you know, exemptions for um, comments that were made um, on the basis of them being reasonable and comments that were made in good faith, comments that are made under artistic... Uh, There's a public rationale. interest defence and if you tell the truth, isn't there? If yes, you, there If you is. can back it up. There is. I yeah. mean, this, this is literally as fundamental as protecting the vulnerable in our community, the, the vulnerable who don't have a voice, and, and they need the protection. Uh, Jonathan, would the PM want to risk alienating his key advisor in this way, do you think? Well, it's not just Warren Mundine. He's got... Uh, there's an extraordinary uh, coalition of ethnic groups who've come together on this. You've got the Jews, the Arabs, the Chinese, the Lebanese, the Vietnamese, the Armenians, the Greeks. I mean, you know, th this is really risky territory for, for George Brandis, and he's, he's keenly aware of that. He, he wanted to just um, repeal Section 18C. Uh, by the way, Section 18C is not... Uh, often people say it's a crime to... The, the words are offend, insult, intimidate, humiliate. It's not in the criminal code. It's a civil provision. Mm -hmm. So it, it ends up, you know, being a fine or, or some sort of conciliation. But the way it works is, you know, if you say something about me that, you know, vilifies me or intimidates me on racial grounds, I first have to uh, appeal to the Human Rights Commission and then if we can't sort it out in mediation, and by the way, the vast majority of cases are sorted out in mediation, then it might turn up in court. Now, there were five settlements last year in court, so that gives you an idea of, you know, how many people are actually ending up getting monetary payments at the end. But politically, extraordinarily risky. Um, Abbott knows that. Uh, Brandis knows that, and you've got some of the most effective advocates, uh, ethnic leaders, who have been coming to Canberra and just lobbying day in, day out. Which, so, Jonathan, means there's yeah. a compromise on the cards here, There'll be there? a compromise. They'll, th th what they'll do, I, I reckon, you know, if I was going to bet on it, they'll remove the words offend and insult. They might put the word vilify in. Mm. They'll, they'll probably keep intimidate and humiliate. One ethnic leader said to me, if they get rid of humiliate, it's on. Yeah. So, you know, there, there's all of these discussions going on at the moment, but what they're also talking about is inserting a tougher criminal prov provision um, against hate speech. So that will mollify some of these ethnic groups. All right, well, that'll definitely be one worth looking at over the next few months. A Labor could be moving to end its deal to give the Greens their first preferences in the rerun WA Senate election. Fairfax is reporting today some ALP figures want to send votes to other parties instead. The change could be a major blow to Scott Ludlam's re-election chances. The Greens fear the move could give Tony Abbott the upper hand in the Senate. It is critical that the Labor Party recognise that the community really wants the, the Parliament to stand up to Tony Abbott and I think there'd be people incredibly disappointed if Labor actually facilitated an outcome that gave Tony Abbott control of the Senate. The Coalition says Labor's political marriage with the Greens is far from over. I think it's very important for those people to remember when casting their vote that a vote for Labor is ultimately a vote for the Greens because the divorce never happened, it was merely a trial separation. Jonathan, could this backfire on Labor if it goes ahead like their deals with uh, Family First on preferences did back in 2004? Yes. Uh, the, the problem with the Senate is if you don't... I mean, traditionally, I mean, for, certainly for the last three elections, the deal has been the quid pro quo, quo is you know, the Greens put Labor above the Libs and in return Labor chucks the Greens up the top of the Senate ticket. But here... We, we, it's sort of been cut off. The Greens have been cut off a bit because Labor's got nothing to gain from the Greens. It's a Senate re-election. So if Labor does these sort of plays footsies with these micro-parties and you have folks like Glenn Drury doing these incredibly complex preference swaps, you know, you could get the Pirate Party. I mean, I would not rule out the Pirate Party, you know. We should Senate just clear seat. up who the Pirate Party are, is, Jonathan, because people are going to be thinking it's guys <laughs> with stumps and eye patches. But they're, they're kind of uh, libertarians who believe in internet freedom, aren't they? That's right. Yeah. Although I can't discount the fact that one of them may or may not be wearing an eye patch. <laughs> I mean, you just don't know. OK, so Ben, what do you think about this idea? Um, is this a bad move if Labor is considering it or is it good to distance themselves from the Greens? I think this is just a classic case of political branding and strategy. It's a move to disassociate Labor from the Greens and I suspect that it speaks to an underlying tension in the Labor Party. So you have an element of the Labor Party which appeals to progressive 
individuals in inner urban areas who really like soy lattes, and then another wing of the Labour Party that perhaps appeals to individuals who work in construction and like VBs. Obviously, incredibly crude caricatures, but I think there's some sociological truth in this. And when you distance yourselves from the Greens, that's an effective way of signalling to one half of that equation that you're on board with them and that you're not going to sell them down the river for rainforest in Tasmania, for example. LJ, what do you think of this speculation around um, preference deals? Would it be the right move by Labor? Well, you know, I mean, it's, it's important to look at the outcomes. Last, uh, last year, uh, when the, um, the vote took place, ALP was just under the two quotas, the Greens two-thirds of a quota and, and the, the minority parties one-third. So the reality is that if, if those votes continue along that line, even with the distributions flowing separately, uh, it's still likely that the second ALP senator will get up as well as Ludlam. So the outcome's the same. OK. Jonathan, you think the outcome would probably be the same? Well, Scott Ludlam... Has, has said, uh, I spoke to him this afternoon and he said, I mean, he would say this, by the way, but he said, uh, you know, my strategy has always been that we can't depend on any, any preferences. I actually don't know. I, th I think it's certainly risky for him. Um, I mean, obviously his seat's in the balance, so he needs all the preferences he can get, but it really depends on what the Labor vote is in this um, election. There are so many variables in this Senate election. I mean, anyone who says they can have any idea about, you know, picking seats is, is kidding themselves. Because even the turnout to the vote is, is exactly. another variable, isn't it? Exactly. And, and what you've, you often find in these circumstances, it's, it's like in the US with the midterm elections, you get the more politically engaged, the more passionate people coming out, which can polarise the vote. So, you know, moderates often t you know, stay home. So there's all of these things in the mix which um, no one is, is venturing a guess at, at who's going to win a Senate seat. All right. Coming up next on The Drum, we're going to talk with the Syrian-born author Raya Elias. She's here to chat about her new book, Harley Loco, a memoir of hard living, hair and post-punk from the Middle East to the Lower East Side. That's next. Our guest tonight is Raya Elias, musician, author, hairdresser and rabble-rouser. In the introduction to her memoir, Raya's good friend Elizabeth Gilbert, the best-selling author of Eat, Pray, Love, describes her as a Syrian lesbian, ex-junkie, ex-con, ex-street hustler, Detroit tough, giant-hearted, rock and roll piece of work <laughs> who probably had sex with your wife at some point back <laughs> in the 80s. Raya Elias is the author of Harley Loco, a memoir, memoir of hard living, hair and post-punk from the Middle East to the Lower East Side, and she joins us now on the drum. Raya, thanks so much for coming on. Wow, what an introduction. <laughs> what an introduction by your friend Elizabeth Gilbert. Yes. Um, how did the nice girl from Connecticut meet the wild girl from Detroit? Oh, my God, it's such a great thing. She... Uh, she, well, her friend, I was doing her friend's hair, and uh, I was a hairdresser, and her friend had an intervention for her. <laughs> Not a drug intervention, a hair intervention. Uh -huh. So she brought her to me, who lived on the Lower East Side, and she came with a little bit of a, a, a fro, you mm -hmm. know? And it was like, basically, you know, we always say it's like Carol King met Keith Richards. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I, had I think my... she described it as, as an Art Garfunkel haircut. It is. A, yeah. It isn't. It wasn't. I didn't want. You know, I didn't want to be so rude, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, it was. It was pretty bad. And um, so we met, and we just started telling each other stories, and we started getting really close. And so she encouraged you to write this book. Oh, she bullied me, uh -huh. as if she could, but only she could. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now. Let's just make it clear, you weren't just cutting hair for stars like Elizabeth. Uh, you've also done hairdos in the beauty salon at Rikers Island, one of America's <laughs> most notorious prisons. What was that like? Ah, it was tough. It was tough, but it was my saving grace. Um, because without having not had that, I would have been literally stuck in my you know, cell house, cell block house, day after day. So, and that was my sort of way of breaking in and not being bullied so much and getting a little bit of respect um, because I was a pretty good hairdresser, you know, so I went in and all the chicks, boy, they lined up for me, uh -huh. you know. So how, yeah, there must be a pressure to get a prison haircut right that's not like any <laughs> hair salon. I imagine that there could be some pretty fierce payback if you do a bad haircut. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, it's bad. It's bad. I mean, you know, I learned how to do a mean fade in prison by, you know, this really incredibly tough bull dagger in prison. And she taught me and then I taught her how to do a rock and roll shag. So it was it was a it was a great uh, um, exchange. But yes, um, my first haircut in there was really, really I was under so much pressure because I thought if I screw this up, I'm I'm done. 
Now, a lot of the book is set in New York in the 80s. Uh, you were living in an area known as Alphabet City. Before the area was gentrified, it was the time of the Tompkins Square riots. It was the time of crack cocaine in New York City. What was New York like back then? Well, there was before crack and after crack. I mean, that was specifically a... It was a... Uh, things just instantly changed. So before crack, it was like art, the music. I mean, it was bad. It wasn't gentrified, but it was... It was still very artsy and, and kind of had that, um, that core that wasn't the evil core. And then the moment crack hit in 1984, it changed into like the mother, that mother of three children, my neighbor, was hooking on the corners. And it all of a sudden got really, really exceedingly seedy and, um, and just really, really um, seemed to have fallen apart. But... But it was a time of absolute and ultimate creativity in, in the city. So this is the time of CBGBs in New York and, and all the great art rock of the time. What was that like? Great art rock and, um, you know, Jean-Michel Basquiat, Keith Haring and, and uh, the, the Ramones and Blondie and all those guys. I mean, it was, in, it was incredible anywhere that you went. You know, you'd walk into CBGB's or the Mud Club or you'd go to Danceteria and you'd be hanging out with like Peter Murphy or Madonna or, uh, or you know, or uh, Johnny Thunders or any of these guys. It was incredible. It's part of that in an, in an environment like that where it is a little bit dangerous, that the rent is low and that artists can still afford to live in those kind of areas. Well, absolutely. But, you know, you know what they say. It's like first the artists go in, then the gays go in, and there goes the neighborhood. <laughs> like, you know, I mean, that's uh, but it was it was dangerous back then just because of the drug culture. It was before Rudy Giuliani came yeah. in. And so you could do basically anything and just get a slap on the wrist. I think I was arrested maybe 14 times in one year and never, never did any time. It was like oh, I was doing this or doing that, and they were like, oh, bad girl, and there you so go. So what Giuliani did worked. It absolutely worked. And, yeah, as much of a you know, fascist as he seemed, he really cleaned it up, yeah. Now, you spent the first seven years of your life in Syria, and then you emigrated to Detroit with your family, and you describe what the immigrant experience does for people like your father, which I found very interesting, because they're strong men in control of their lives in their homeland, and then they have to move to somewhere where they don't know the language, they don't have the connections they have anymore, and, and they have to work in menial labour, and they lose control of their lives. What was that like for your father? Um, you know, my, father, my father's story is the story of a hero, I mean, for me, because it took so much humility and it took so much um, uh, bravery to, to do what he did. I mean, you know, at the time that he moved, he was in his 40s. And, um, and, and he, like you said, he took a menial job as basically a janitor, as a window washer. And this was a man who owned lands. And I mean, he was a hustler back in the day, too. But he was uh, not an educated man, but a very smart man who did very well in Syria. And so, you know, it was really hard to watch. But I think the rewards for him were incredible because all he really wanted was a, an education for his kids. Um, I happened to not give him what he wanted, but, you know, my, my eldest brother is an attorney and a dentist. You know, my... <laughs> talk about <laughs> overachievers. Yeah. 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 So he, he did, you know, he made up for me a little yeah. bit. But, uh, but, yeah, very proud man and, and yet became um, an even, you know... Uh, larger than life sort of man because he gave up so much for us. You tell a story in the book too of the trick or treat night where there was a little bit cultural confusion. Share that story with us. Oh my God. We were in the States for maybe a week and uh, nobody spoke English. And my uncle, who's a shoe salesman who had lived in Detroit, was away on, at a convention. And so, you know, dinner time, we're having dinner and the doorbell rings and I open the door and there's these little monsters, like <laughs> literally, and they're like, wait, 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 and they're shoving things in our faces at the door, and uh, Baba, Baba, Shuhaida, what's going on? And and he comes over, and we look down the sidewalk, and there's bigger monsters, and and we shut the door, and he's literally shaking the screen like there were flies stuck on it, you know, he's like, no, no speak English, no... 
So we shut the door and all night, I mean, they just kept at it. And uh, they were trick-or-treating and we had no idea. And in the morning, our house was soaked and egged and everything. <laughs> but, you know, it was really the first time. It was our first sort of example of you guys are different, you know, because we didn't know that that's what was going on. We just thought that they hated us because we were Syrian and we were in the sort of blue-collar Polish environment and we didn't know anything about anything and we thought that was our welcome to the neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> right. It also strikes me that places that you spent a significant amount of time in your life have now been changed beyond belief. Aleppo, where you grew up initially, is now struck by civil war. Then there's Detroit, where you emigrated to, which has had this amazing overhaul. of The population has fled. The city's gone bankrupt. And then there's the Lower East Side, which has completely changed as well. How was that for you going back and writing this memoir and being confronted by these places that are so important to you undergoing such extraordinary change? Well, Stephen, you know, um, I think change is, is so relevant. I mean, I've changed so much, and I've been overhauled. And, uh, you know, going to, when I was in Aleppo four years ago, it had not yet been damaged. It was beautiful and amazing. But, you know, um, that, that part hurts. Um, Detroit, you know, I've been back to, and I see the renaissance that's happening in Detroit right now, which is amazing. And um, I think in New York, especially, there's a place for everyone. So there is room for change everywhere. Ray, great to have you on. Thanks so much. Thanks, Thanks to so all much. of our panellists tonight, LJ Locke and Ben um, Herskovich, and also Jonathan Swan. We'll see you si same time tomorrow night. Catch you then. <laughs>